Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our discussion of probability. This is the third lesson in our series on probability, with today focusing on the multiplication counting principle. Now, this will probably be a little bit shorter of a video um, for you today because it does rely very heavily on some, some ideas that we developed in the last video on, on counting outcomes uh, using counting trees and area models um, and how we can use those kinds of models to look at events when we're not really sure what all the outcomes are or when the probabilities of the outcomes are not the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up a problem that I've already shown you in a previous video. Um, this problem deals with with building different types of skateboards, and the original problem said to create a tree diagram to determine how many different skateboards can be built using only the decks and wheels shown. And then we gave five decks for skateboards and three sets of wheels for skateboards, and I had you build a counting tree, where we listed all five choices for our first decision, and then we made branches off of each of those, showing our second decision, so that um, if we picked an alien deck, we could have any of the three wheel sets. If we picked a Birdman deck, we could have any of the three wheel sets, candy, and so on, all the way down. And then off to the side, we listed what all the possible outcomes were for this pair of decisions. Now, I want us to focus on something slightly different today. Previously, we were looking at how to build the diagram and what the diagram shows us, but I wanted to point something out for you today um, that, that, that draws our attention in a slightly different direction. Notice we have a list of decks, and we said there are five decks that we can use to build our skateboard. And notice that we had three sets of wheels, the Eagle, the Cloud, and the Red Hot. And notice that there were 15 different board combinations. Now, when you look at that, probably something immediately comes to mind. If you want a second to think about that, you can certainly pause the video and do so. But hopefully, um, you've been able to realize that 5 times 3 does equal 15. We have five different types of decks, three different wheel sets for a total of 15 different types of boards that we could build. I wonder if that's just a coincidence or if that's something that happens consistently. So here's the second problem we had in the set of notes um, in the previous video. We said that we have two dice, or we have a die, I apologize, um, and the first decision we have to make is what gets rolled on the first die. And then we have a decision of which card to draw out of this hand that has six cards in it. And we said rather than drawing a counting tree, we could also illustrate this using an area model, where one side, the, the vertical um, side here, has the dice, and across the horizontal we have listed the cards. And each square represents where those two um, items uh, are joined. So we could have a one on the die and a three card, two on the die, three card, and it gives us a very organized way of seeing all the options. But you may not have noticed that the die had six possible choices. The deck of cards or the hand of cards had six possible choices. And when you look at the table, you can see that there are 36 different things that happen. And just like in the previous example, if I multiply the number of choices I have for the die times the number of choices I have for the card, I get the total number of possible combinations. Here's one more. This is the exact same problem that I gave you in the previous video where we're dealing with two spinners. The first spinner has three sections, the second spinner has four sections, and you can see that we created an area diagram over here for that, giving us 12 different possibilities. And I went ahead and did it as a tree diagram or a counting tree as well, and notice there are 12 different possibilities. That's because there were three sections on spinner one, four sections on spinner two, and when you multiply those together, you get the 12 different combinations. Now, this is something that is, um, is going to happen every single time you have more than one decision, and it's called the multiplication counting principle. It says the total number of outcomes is the product of the number of choices for decision A times the number of choices for decision B, and this continues for any number of decisions. 
So if I were to give you this problem for here on the left, when you rent ski equipment at Bridger Peaks Ski Resort, you choose from four different types of ski boot, five lengths of skis, and two types of poles. How many different outfits are possible? Well, it's important for us to realize that there are several decisions that have to be made. We have to decide what type of boot we want to wear. We have to decide what length of ski we want to wear. And we have to decide what type of pole we're going to carry. Those are the three decisions that have to be made. Well, there are four boots for me to choose from, four different types of ski boots. There are five different lengths of skis and there are two different types of pole. Knowing that, we can use the multiplication counting principle and we can learn that there are 40 different possible outfits. Now that's kind of nice, isn't it? It allows us to find the total number of possible um, combinations without having to go to all the trouble of making the tree or the area model. Now the drawback of the counting principle is is that even though we know there are 40 different combinations, we can't actually see them the way we would be able to in a tree. Take a look at this one. The bicycle lock at the left is a pretty effective deterrent to anyone hoping to jack your ride. There are four dials, each containing the numbers 0 through 9. To open it, you must make four correct decisions, each of the four numbers on the lock. How many different possible solutions could there be to opening the lock? So we have to spin this first dial, we have to spin the second dial, we have to spin the third dial, we have to spin the fourth dial, and if we put them all in the right spot, when we push this red button, we should be able to open the lock and get our bicycle loose from whatever rack we have it attached to. So there are four decisions. What are we going to put on dial one? What are we going to put on dial two? What are we going to put on dial three? And what are we going to put on dial 4? Well, the problem says that there are four dials and that each one has the numbers 0 through 9 on it. Well, that means there are 10 possible uh, positions that lock could be in. Um, a lot of people get confused and say 9, but forget, don't forget that uh, 0 has to be counted as well. So you have the numbers 1 through 9 plus the 0. That's 10 possible choices. Well, you also have 10 possible choices for dial 2, and 10 possible choices for dial 3, and 10 possible choices for dial 4. The multiplication counting principle says we multiply those together, and there are 10,000 possible lock combinations. 10,000 possible lock combinations. And in fact, since we're just dealing with numbers, we would have all the numbers from 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way up to 9999. Nine, 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 which is 10,000 possible combinations. Are you getting the hang of it? Let's make this a little more fun. You and all your friends have decided to spend Friday night watching movies. You decide to watch all the Rocky movies, but you think it would be funny if you watched them in random order since they're all basically the same anyway. How many different orders could you watch them in? Well, when I look here, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different films eight different films. So when I sit down to watch the movies, the first thing I have to decide is what am I going to watch first? Then I'm going to decide what to watch second, what to watch third, what to watch fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. I have to make eight different decisions, one for each movie I'm going to watch. Well, how many choices do I have for movie one? Well, there are eight because there are eight films to choose from. How many movies are there to choose for movie two? Some of you might be thinking there are eight, but you have to remember we already watched one of them. We're not going to watch that a second time. So now there are only seven movies to choose from. Moving on to movie three, I've already watched one of them. I've already watched a second. Whichever ones I've already watched, I'm not going to watch a second time, meaning there are only six left. And you can probably follow the thought process through for all the rest of the movies. 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. That's going to give me the total number of possible orders in which I can view the movie. It's actually 40,320. Probably a lot more than you were expecting, but remember, 
There's a lot of different ways we could look at this. If you think of this as being a counting tree, just remember that the first branch is going to have eight smaller branches off of it, and then each of those is going to have seven smaller branches, and this is going to grow pretty rapidly. By the way, there is a special symbol for when we count down like this, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. This is called a permutation or an arrangement of things because we're deciding what order we're going to put these in. But the symbol looks like this. It's just an exclamation point. Now, I often ask my students what this uh, symbol means, and when they don't know, I usually tell them that when you read this the right way, it says eight <laughs> because it's an exclamation point. <laughs> they don't think it's funny either. The correct way to read this is eight factorial. A factorial just says take this number times every number counting down to 1. 8 times 7 times 6 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Now, if I were to give you 5 factorial, that means 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. There is a way to do this on your calculator much more quickly than having to type that in all the way from 5 to 1. It goes like this. You're going to press the 5 key because we're working with the number 5. And the 5 is going to appear on your screen. The cursor is going to go to the right. And then you're going to look for the PRB button. The PRB button says we're going to be looking in the probability menu. If you're having trouble finding that on your calculator, the TI-30 series has the PRB button right here. I just circled it with a yellow circle to make it easier to find. And when you press that, this is what's going to appear. In PR, this is a permutations button. We're not going to talk about that much today. In CR, which is a combinations button, we're not really talking about that today. But then over here, all the way to the right, you've got the exclamation point. So if you press the right arrow twice, you'll have an underline that moves from the NPR to the NCR and over to the exclamation point. And then you're just going to press Enter. That's all the way down at the bottom. It also has the equal sign on it. And when you press that, it's going to show up on your screen as 5 factorial. Well, if you press the Enter button again, you'll get the solution, 120. Now, I would recommend that you take just a second and grab a calculator, pause the video, and try 7 factorial yourself. Make sure you know where those buttons are on your calculator. Make sure you know how to do this, because you don't want to have to do 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 every single time. If you had trouble with that, you might want to go back and rewatch the video as we talk about what sequence to type those things in, but most people are going to find that to be pretty easy. Hopefully you came up with 5,040. Now occasionally I'll have a student who tells me, you know, it really doesn't take me that long to type in 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and then hit the equal sign, so I'm not going to learn how to use that probability button. But think about this, 13 factorial, you would have to type in a whole lot more, or 50 factorial, or 60, or 100, you could have all kinds of factorials that you might have to type in, and eventually you're going to reach a point where it's much easier just to type in the symbol than it is to type in all the numbers one at a time. Remember, you don't want to have to type in everything all the way down to 1. I'd recommend pausing the video and trying this. I'm going to assume you've already done that, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you that this is 6,227,020,800. Lots and lots and lots and lots of possibilities there. Okay, one more problem. You hold up the deck of cards at the left so your friend can't see them, and you ask her to pull out four cards, one at a time. How many different orders of cards are possible? Remember, what are the decisions that your friend has to make? Well, she has to pick card one, card two, card three, and card four. She has to pick four cards. Well, how many choices does she have for that first card? Well, if you look at the hand, there are nine cards there. Once she pulls that out, how many decisions does she have, or how many options does she have for her second card? Well, notice that we didn't put the card back in, so now she only has eight choices. And you can probably see where this is heading. There were nine cards, two are already missing. Now she only has seven choices and six choices. Using the multiplication counting principle, we can say that there are 3,024 possible orders for four cards 
when there are nine to choose from. 3,024. Notice it's counting down. This would be something like a partial factorial. Notice it's not 9 factorial because it's not 9 all the way down to 1. It's just 9, 8, 7, 6. Be very conscientious about that. You don't want to get in the habit of just hitting 9 factorial without thinking about how many cards you're pulling. If she had had 9 cards, or I had had 9 cards, or you had had 9 cards, and we pulled them out all the way down to 1, if we draw 9, then we would have done 9 factorial. This brings us to that NPR key that's on your calculator. That's N permutations of R, uh, N permutation R. It basically says this. If I have nine cards, and we're going to see how many different orders we could draw four. Nine, draw four. We could hit that button on our, our calculator, and it would compute it for us. And basically what it says is this. 9 factorial divided by 5 factorial. The 9 factorial says, well, if we drew all the cards, that would be 9 times everything down to 1. But I don't want to go down to 1. I just want to go out the first four numbers, the 9, 8, 7, 6. In order to eliminate the 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1, I would need to divide by those because 5 divided by 5, 4 divided by 4, 3 divided by 3, 2 divided by 2, and 1 divided by 1, those all become 1's. Anything divided by itself is a 1, leaving me with just the 9, 8, 7, and 6. That then would give us the 3,024. 3,024. This is not something that I would be assessing on a unit test in my class, um, but it is something that in a higher level um, probability class or the stats class you might be looking at. So I thought I'd at least throw it out there. My students often ask me what this key is for. It's basically a shortcut for what you've done here. Now keep in mind that we're looking at the number of possible orders of cards or how many orders of cards are possible. This 3024 gives us King, Queen, Jack, and 10 as being a different order from King, Jack, 10, and Queen. Now, there is a time, or there are times, where you might want to consider those as the same thing. For example, if I just said, what is the probability of getting a king, queen, jack, or ten in your hand? Um, you would consider these two outcomes as being the same. And so there are times where you would want to eliminate all the duplicate numbers or duplicate cards that just come to you in different orders. That would be using NCR, using combinations instead of permutations. But there again, that's not something we're going to get into in my class at least, and it's something that is worth further investigation if it's something that's interesting to you. As always, thank you so much for joining us here today. I hope this was insightful and informative for you. If it was, make sure you make uh, you let us know. Make sure you give us a like, give us a thumbs up, hit those notifications, and ring that bell so that we know that you're out there watching and that what we're doing here is of benefit to you. Um, we wish you all the very best. You all take care of yourselves, all right? Bye-bye.